All right, so I'm delighted to have uh, Paul Akers here with me today. We're going to be discussing lean, and not just lean manufacture, but lean when it comes to health um, and everything. So, Paul, thanks very much for joining me. My, my pleasure, Declan. My pleasure. And I know you're there with your, your 95-year-old mother, uh, Elizabeth. Yeah, so that's she's absolutely right next awesome. to me right now. <laughs> Fitting well at 95 is, is just amazing. Oh, yeah. so. She's doing great. Right, so Paul, this is your introduction. So I'm going to introduce you just quickly to listeners of uh, the podcast because uh, this is a little bit different to the, let's say, the ordinary because I would talk a lot to uh, musicians and athletes, but I know you come at all this from a different angle and I love it. So I can't wait to, to bring something new to listeners. So okay. Paul is an entrepreneur, business owner, author, speaker, and lean maniac. But before that, He's a carpenter and a creator and loves the beauty of woodworking. So it's, uh, it's going to be a super interesting chat today. Uh, an author who's traveled the world. Uh, the ones that I've read here are Lean Health. I absolutely loved it because I work with clients on fat loss transformations. And I took huge learnings from this book in actually helping people on their weight loss journeys, getting them to get in the process really lean as possible. I get their, their food tracker into my email inbox every morning, and that was all based on, on learnings from getting super lean about the process. Mm -hmm. uh, Paul introduced uh, Ryan Tierney of Seeding Matters Northern Ireland to lean thinking, and this helped them to transform their company. And this was their bathrooms when I visited their facility, and I absolutely uh, admired this. It was the idea that you leave the place better than you found it. So wherever you go, whether it's a football team, a business, anywhere you want to leave the place better than you found it you want to hand that jersey on to the next player in a better condition than when you found it so I love that selfless outlook this was my own little change I kept going for my slippers when I wanted to get my gym shoes and my gym shoes when I wanted to get my slippers so this was actually my first two second improvement that that Paul encouraged oh, everyone to do <laughs> Uh, and Paul, we're going to discuss your, your jungle juice, as I like to call it, or, or Hulk juice uh, later on during the chat, mm -hmm. along with many other things about how lean can be implemented in, in places where it probably could be the most and maybe isn't the likes of hospitals. We'll chat a little bit about consultancy firms, which aren't traditionally manufacturing. We're going to look at, is it actually exhausting to live this lean lifestyle where you're looking for you know, you're looking for improvements everywhere. And we're going to chat to you a little bit about your own nutrition, uh, what you like to eat and so, uh, the places you've traveled and how that might have influenced things. So, Paul, well, let's, uh, yeah, let's just launch into it and, and maybe chat about uh, how lean can be used uh, across different industries and, and chat about some of the waste you might have seen yourself in, in the medical industry or the, the healthcare area. Right, absolutely. absolutely. So is that where you want to start? You want me to talk about the medical industry, Declan? Yeah, or do you know what? I'd actually maybe like you to talk about, I know, you no, know, let's chat about your own uh, lean journey and your obsession and where it maybe came from briefly because I know it, but I think learn, uh, listeners would like to know that first, actually. Well, I think that the most important thing that people need to understand about a lean journey is, number one, is it's for very few people in the world probably only 2% of the people listening to this podcast will implement what I'm going to talk about. And the reason why is because of ego. So I will explain. Mm -hmm. So back in 1997, I started my company and my company is international. We do business in 40 countries, 3000 distributors around the world, tens of millions of dollars of business. And, you know, it's a real American dream success story. I started in my garage and, you know, built a multi-million dollar company and yeah. things were good. But the problem was ego. So three years into my running my company, I started in 97, 2000. I had at that point won all kinds of awards, uh, business startup of the year. I was making a ton of money. Everything was going great. Everybody loved my company. It was neat. It was clean. It was organized. I'm OCD. From all external factors, it looked like I was doing everything right. And then the Japanese consultants came into my company and they looked around and I asked them if they could help me with managing my inventory. And they said, I don't know. And I said, what do you mean you don't know? And I said, well, and they said, you know, you don't know what you're doing, you're clueless, and you don't know how to manufacture. Now, I was an expert in manufacturing. Everything I'd done had turned to gold, basically. <laughs> and, 
And so for them to say that was, was very harsh. Very, yeah, very harsh. Yeah. And so I had a choice. I could let my ego get in the way and tell them what I thought. I'll tell you what I thought. I said, <laughs> I make more money than you. I'm smarter than you. I'm older than you. I know more than you. I've done more than you. What business have you built? Show me the products that you've developed. Show me the patents that you hold. Those are all the things that went through my mind. So you see yeah. the ego block just came, boom, just right front and center. And so I could have just shut them down. But for whatever reason, by the grace of God, I didn't. And I said, well, what am I doing wrong? And they said, you need to learn Kaizen, lean manufacturing of the Toyota production system. I didn't know what any of those were. And, you know, that was Greek to me. And I'm Greek and I didn't understand it. So anyways... The bottom line is my ego for the, for whatever reason did not get in the way at that moment. And I was very lucky. And they began to teach me and show me what I was doing wrong. And they took processes that were taking me 45 minutes and they did it in five minutes in one week. So one week of these people, these two kids being in there, they took things that I was an expert in, that I was winning the awards for, that I was doing everything right. And said, no, it's total crap. It's not, it's not bad. It's total crap crap what you're doing you have no clue what you're doing and they demonstrated that and they did it over and over again yeah. so that's really the beginning part of my lean journey and then the revelation that happened to me was I realized yes I didn't know what I was doing and today I sit here 20 years later and I still don't know what I'm doing if you were to compare me to Toyota or you know Lexus I, I really don't know what I'm doing I'm I'm on the right path and I'm making progress, but I'm so far behind where they are. It's almost staggering. But that's what the lean journey is all about. Mm -hmm. Step by step every day, you get a little bit better. Yeah. So if the longer you're on the journey, the better things get. So I've been on the journey for 20 years. Toyota's been on the journey for 50 years. So I'm 30 years behind them, you know, mm -hmm. but I'm, doing, I'm really super happy and I'm getting better and life is fantastic. Yeah. So yeah. that's kind yeah. of the nutshell of what happened. And then, you know, I wrote the book because everybody started coming and seeing what we were doing as we even got better and better and better. And then I got tired of explaining it to everyone. So I said, I'm just going to write a book and tell them all my screw ups. Cause basically that's what my book's about is all the mistakes I made so that you don't have to make the same mistakes. Mm -hmm. And uh, the rest is history. The thing is in 16 languages, it's all over the world. I mean, I, I talk to people all over the world every day. Amazing. Uh, any questions? But your passion for that comes through in the book. Just when you mentioned the people, the people you've met and the journey that Lean has, I suppose, helped you go on, right, worldwide with people getting in touch. And I was amazed how quick you got back to me and how receptive and just how positive you were. I mean, it's a credit to you. And also uh, just the humility, though. I just want to go back to that when they told you this, that this is a load of crap. So how does that hit? You know, how does that mentally, you know, you can go in two directions, right? And this is something typically that a lot of people come across. They're given a bit of criticism and they have to decide how genuine it is. Is it constructive feedback or is it somebody trying to hold them back, right? Right. And so what was the thought process when you heard this? Did you have this little feeling in your gut that there was actually something here you needed to take note of? Oh yeah, that's absolutely what happened. As I felt exactly that feeling that there was something that I was missing in life. And uh, and Don, why don't you come over here and sit down over here, and I'll make you some coffee. And uh, I have my, all my mom's sisters here. <laughs> and Don, I'm on a video conference, so come over here. <laughs> come, come over here. Hello. <laughs> I have all my mom's. My mom has nine sisters. Wow. And there's only three. There's only three alive, and they're all here for the next two weeks. So I'm taking care of them. Amazing. We need to get them all <laughs> no, on the call, no, Paul. Okay, you got to sit down over there, okay? <laughs> okay, I'm going to get your coffee. There we go. So, uh, yeah, I definitely felt a little tinged like there was something I was missing, and thank God I felt that way, and that's exactly what happened. And, and then, you know, they took me to Japan, and then I saw the contrast between what was happening with Lexus and Toyota and compared to me, and I go, oh, my gosh, I'm not even on the same planet. It's just so bad. So mm -hmm. that's what mm -hmm. happened. Can I ask you, Paul, I watched those, some of the videos you put up from the Japan experience and traveling over there. I'm sure you've been several times, but it was just from one of them. And you were in a manufacturing facility where the employees wore um, 
like uh, they had some sort of mechanism that was telling them to, to keep walking fast, right? Or that was being measured. And so I wanted to ask you, do you not, do you not think that there's a line between trust and crossing that line maybe with things like that that's actually measuring the pace of how people are walking? Because could that be misconstrued by, by staff? Well, sure, it could be misconstrued by many, many people. But mm -hmm. if you understand the target, and so this is the big thing about a lean journey and why it works with some people and it doesn't work with other people. Yeah. Because a lot of people will take the tools, like measuring how fast you're walking and implement it, and people are going to push back. Other people, and this is what I learned to do, mm -hmm. to explain the philosophy behind what we're trying to do. So if you equip your people with the philosophy – there's no problem. So the philosophy is our target is to deliver quality at the lowest cost and the highest and the highest quality to our customers. So we're there with one purpose and one purpose only, and that is to serve our customers. So yeah. if we're kind of lollygagging around, looking at text messages, not really paying attention, then we're not going to be able to deliver low cost, high quality to our customer. We're going to charge our customers for our lackadaisical attitude, for mm -hmm. our slothfulness, for our unattentiveness. Yeah. And yeah. so once they understand that, it's different. So if I told my, if I, if this is what I tell my team members, I say, would you want to get a package from Amazon where there was a defect in the product? And they say, no. Would you want to get a product, a, a package from Amazon that they said they would get it to you in three days, but it came in six days? Mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. say, no. Well, why not? Because I, they told me, they gave me a certain expectation and I want them to deliver on that expectation. But if we're not continuously improving, then the entropy, the, the word entropy means, you know, denigration, things are going to go yeah. keep going back. Then entropy is going to set in our company and our quality is going to go down. It's just default. It's the laws of nature. It's the second yeah. law of thermodynamics or, or yeah. I don't I remember what, actually, I'm not sure if it's a second or not, but the bottom line is entropy is going to set in. So lean and continuous improvement is the countermeasure to entropy. And, and we want to be very aware of everything we're doing from how fast we're walking to how precisely we're doing things to how little defects we're, we're producing. So yeah. we put these places in, if we put these measures in place, we utilize these tools to serve the customer more effectively. And then here's the next level thinking. If we do a great job of serving the customer, we will survive. We will have their trust and they will keep ordering. And we're going to be able to put food on the table and we're going to be able to create a better future for our family. So ultimately, when we walk more quickly, we're not really just serving the customer. That's the first target we actually ultimately better serve our life our family our community and everything in our network uh of humanity okay love it yeah yeah very interesting yeah it does make sense i was just wondering though which would, would that have been something you incorporated back in america then or that sort of idea well, we, we we didn't look at everything we see in japan we don't incorporate everything at fast Cap. we incorporate a lot of things we did not yeah. incorporate that and i have no problem with incorporating that but we have so many other issues that we need to address that's just not mm. top of it's not top of mind right now but gotcha. i actually like the idea because Basically what that was that you saw in the video, it's just a place where everybody, it's a corridor that everyone has to walk down. And when they walk down it, it automatically times you and tells you if you're on pace with, with a, a reasonable pace. Mm -hmm. And if mm -hmm. not, it just shows you, hey, you did it in 16 seconds instead of what the, the target was 14. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. Or you did it in 13 seconds, so you're a second in front of the target. It kind of lets you feel what a proper pace is. So if, yeah. you were to, if you were to walk with me in fast cap, I walk so fast, it's unbelievable. Because I have urgency. Yeah. Where some yeah. people have no urgency. And they just think manana, whenever, it's going to get done. <laughs> and they walk yeah. just kind of slowly. Mm, mm, I don't mm. do that. So yeah. I, I naturally understand what their Japanese are trying to teach. Because I have urgency. Because I know that my resources are limited. Yeah. See, I don't think that the resources are always going to be there. I, I'm concerned about you know, it, it, uh, utilizing those use, those resources ineffectively, not being a good steward of the resources. And one of the most important resources that all of us have, and is a great equalizer, is time. You mm -hmm. get the same 24 hours that I get, right? But what I yeah. do in that 24 hours defines who I am. 
Yeah. See what I'm saying? So if yeah, I run more quickly and I can get a little bit more done than you, then you accumulate that day after day, month after month, year after year. I get a lot more done than everybody else. Mm-hmm. I'm being a better steward of the resources that are given me, and the prime resource that is given to every human being is time. And that's leading from the front. And I, I really like the time analogy because we talk in the in the sort of the health and wellness personal training industry about the, the number one excuse that we hear for people not making effort on exercise is that I don't have enough time. And then you have to tell them we all have the same 168 hours in the week, right? And even if we are working long hours, there's always that window to get a bit of a workout in and, you know, trying to really get people to, to at least change the phrase. If they're not working out to at least say, I choose where I spend my time. So I'm not making the time and actually taking ownership instead of saying, I don't have the time. Like this is something being inflicted on them. So I, I, I like that. I think it ties in nicely, Paul, with your lean health journey, which you know, I know on the, in the book, I think it was 2014, 2015, 2016, and you talked about that transition. So could, could you tell me a few of the key takeaways during that process and how has that gone? Because I know there's four years since then. So have you maintained those sort of real healthy habits that you developed during oh, that? Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. No, I'll, I'll never go back. I absolutely do. And so, you know, the, the key things are, you know, you lose weight, <laughs> You don't gain weight in the gym, you gain weight in the kitchen. And people need to understand that, you know, you can work out all you want, you can have all the muscles you want, you can do all that stuff. But it's actually this much of the whole equation. Food is this much. Yeah. So what you eat is everything. And Mm. then, you know, my mom's a good example. So, you know, I, I can tell you, so my mom is sitting right next to me here. And one of the things that I'm working on for the last eight weeks is a health transformation with her. So when I came to her about eight weeks ago, she could barely move. She could barely get out of the chair and she's walking a mile every day now. And, you know, we took her to the beach and up and down stairs and everything. And she does everything. And mom, how did you like it yesterday at the beach? Very much. Yeah. It wasn't easy though, but you did it. You walked all the way down the stairs. Nothing's easy. Yeah. Nothing's easy. So the target is to not manage the decline, which most people are doing in life. They're managing their decline. Their health decline just keeps going down. Mm-hmm. The, the, the target is if you're 95 like my, my mom or you're 60 like me, is to always be improving a little bit every day. So not mm-hmm. managing the decline, which is crazy. Mm-hmm. So so food is, is like number one. You've got to eat healthy. You've got to eat great food. And when you do that, and the number one killer in all food is sugar. It's, the, it's, the, it's literally cocaine. It's a disaster. Mm-hmm. And then all the preservatives and sweeteners are the next thing. They're just a total disaster. So if you eliminate that out of your life, then you're going to do way better. If you stop opening boxes, you start eating fresh fruits and vegetables and your whole kitchen. You know, if you went in my kitchen or my home, it's just everywhere is fresh fruit and vegetables everywhere. Mm. And uh, there just aren't any boxes or packages because we. Just, I just don't do that. It just yeah. doesn't make sense. So that that's really the, the the equation. I'm not into the organic thing. I don't take any vitamins. I don't take any supplements. I don't do any protein powder. I don't do any of that nonsense. I don't do mm. any of it. I just eat fresh. fresh fruits and vegetables. You know. Uh, this on is that. I'll grab a. I'll grab a thing. So you know, this is typical, right? This is what's yeah. on my counter all the nice. time. Oh, always the good stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like surround yourself with the right food and you'll eat the right food, right? If it's not in your it's not in your cupboard, you're much less likely to eat it. But I, I've got two questions on this because that really interests me what you say about sugar and sweet stuff because I'm assuming you were having a bit of that before if that was part of the problem. So oh, yeah. what was it like though cutting it out? Was it something, was it a cold turkey decision or was this something you did over a few months little by little you gradually cut no, out? It was, it, was a cold, it was a cold turkey decision because I ate a book called Eat, Move, Sleep by Tom, I can't, Tom Roth. Tom Roth, I read it actually. Oh, yeah. I think I, I read it after read your book. book and I had just done Everest, I just done Mount Kilimanjaro. A week later I went and did Everest Base Camp and I flew to Thailand, and when I flew to Thailand to rest and recover from that little expedition that I did, I, read, I listened to his book on the, on the plane over, and the next morning I woke up and I went into the, the breakfast buffet, and I saw the choices, and I just, all fruits and vegetables, I had eggs, I had some protein and things like that, mm. but I just stopped all the Splenda, all the sweeteners, I started realizing that there was sugar in everything from rotisserie chicken to taco seasoning, 
to 90% of the seasonings that you pull out of your cupboard, you buy all this stuff, all the salad dressings, it's in everything. Mm -hmm. so I started doing olive oil and vinegar and, you know, I just start, and, and I, yes, I did do it cold turkey. And the beauty of that was the results were staggering. In the first week, I think I lost five pounds and I was already pretty fit. I'd just done Everest Base Camp. I'd just done Kilimanjaro, 19,000 yeah. feet. I mean, I was no slouch at that point in the game. Mm, right? mm. And it immediately started coming off. And when I saw the results, when I went cold turkey and pulled that crap out of my diet, everything changed. I mean, I'd go to Starbucks, I'd put two or three Splendas in. And, you know, it was just, a, and I thought I was doing something good for myself because it wasn't sugar. That yeah. stuff's poison. Mm. The, the results mm. were incredible. Almost right, okay. instantaneously. It's a, it's a great point. And, and I want to ask you then, what's going into the morning smoothie now? Because I tried your one and uh, oh, oh, it was God. all sorts going in there, all sorts of good oh, stuff. Well, yeah, it, it's always changing, but I have a general, general thing. I have carrots, I have spinach, I have uh, uh, ginger, I have turmeric, I put blueberries, raspberries, a banana, an apple, a kale, and uh, cinnamon. And that's, that's, about, that's about it right now. Tasty. God, just think of the nutrients in that. Oh, I know. That's the whole thing. And then you start your day with that level of nutrients. I mean, what, what are you going to be like all day? People always say to me, how do you have so much energy? How do you do what you're going to do? I mean, mom, would you say I have a lot of energy? Absolutely. It's just like I'm nonstop. <laughs> At mm. six, you know, at six years old, I'm just like, da, 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 go. I never stop. And everybody's around me goes, where the hell do you get all this energy? <laughs> well, I'm eating well, number one, yes. and I'm very positive about life. And the big thing is, from a lean perspective, everything's always getting better in my life. So if everything's always getting better, I'm naturally going to be mentally more sharp mm. and feeling better. I, mean, I want to use this word feeling. I feel better because things around me are improving all the time. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. And I actually took another thing from your book that I think is important to share with people who want to cut out sweet stuff because you mentioned uh, traveling around the world and, you know, people often will make, and this was relevant to talking about different industries. So you'll have consultants, you know, maybe not at the minute, but who travel and eat out a lot. They can actually, for dessert, ask, could they get a fruit salad, right? Instead of saying, I have to pick something here and go in for the creme brulee or some super sweet, sugary dessert that you used to actually ask, you know, guys, can you do me a fruit salad? And a lot of the time they would do that for you, even if it wasn't on the menu. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, you know, like a good example is with my mom. My mom likes ice cream. She likes all that stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So what I do for her is I cut a banana. I put a little bit of, of natural peanut butter, no sugar, because there's sugar in peanut butter like crazy, but I have natural peanut butter. And then I put a date or a raspberry on top of it. So little slices, and mm. that's dessert. And so I've got all my ants here, and this is the dessert that we feed them instead of all the crap that most people would tolerate. And they love it. They, they think it's fantastic. And, I, and it's such a simple dessert. Yeah, dates are great for that sweetness, actually, that yeah. real nice um, sweet hit. So I was going to ask you then, just from, from all your travels, is, has there been a particular dish that you've come across, you know, like a, a food uh, item or, you know, a meal that you've really resonated with you or you just loved? Well, I love fish and I had fish last night. I went to an Italian restaurant and so I love, you know, fish a lot, fish and vegetables. If I was going to eat one thing consistently, that's what it would be. I love the fish in Thailand very much. And uh, if I was going to tell you one of my favorite foods in the whole world, which is kind of crazy, it's called durian. Do you know what durian is? No, never heard of it. Durian is a, 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 a tropical Asian fruit a big huge fruit and it's very creamy it's like a custard and it's and to most people it stinks it's like okay. it's rotten but to, <laughs> once you develop a taste for it it's like the most delicious thing in the whole world so i would say my favorite fruit in the whole world if i could just have anything is just durian it's just crazy crazy good right you've probably never seen it in the states yet though right oh, it's something you have no. to travel for oh no you got to go to asia to get it but it, it's a crazy fruit and it it's a big controversial fruit because it stinks so much. They don't even let you bring it in the hotel. They don't let you bring it in the hotel because it smells rotten when you bring it in. And, and I know it sounds bad. It's actually so delicious. Everybody, all you know, people go people go to Asia just to eat durian. I mean, it's that wow. good. <laughs> it sounds like one of these things you know we say here it's like marmite you either love it or hate it you know there's right, like this, right, right, it, right. it really divides people 
Um, there was just two, because Paul, I really appreciate your time. There's just two questions that I mentioned at the start that I'd love to go into now, just to, we're flipping back a little bit from the lean health to, you'd mentioned that the healthcare industry, right? And at the minute, it's obviously particularly topical with, with COVID worldwide now, and, and, and efficiency is a big issue. It's always been a big issue. But yeah, what are your thoughts on that? Because I had heard you mention in a podcast recently that you just, you looked at the, the I think you were in a hospital and you were just amazed that, you saw quite a lot of waste there and how can people drive change there? Because it's, you, I, I don't know, maybe it was the call, but you sounded like it was a real uphill battle in the healthcare industry for lean to be accepted or, or really get in there. Yeah, well, you, the, here's the whole key in life. And this is, a, you said a key word drive. You cannot drive lean. It doesn't work that way. Mm, mm. So when, when, when the consultants came into me, they showed me what I was doing wrong and I made a decision to catch it and take it. You understand? Yeah. They didn't say, Paul, you gotta do this, you gotta do this, you gotta do this, you gotta do this. No, they presented it to me and I caught it and I went after it. So you can't drive it in the healthcare industry. You know, the mm -hmm. egos, ego, you just go back, you wanna talk about the most egotistical industry in the whole world, uh, you're going to talk about that industry. I mean, you have doctors, they think they're smarter than everyone else. You have nurses that have, you know, advanced degrees and, you know, they were trained this way and you can't do that because of protocol and, oh, it's just, it's just excuse after excuse. So it's a nightmare industry to drive it into because the predominance of ego that permeates uh, the whole industry. So it's a, it's very very difficult. It's tough, it's tough I, don't to to drive, I don't try to drive anything anywhere, Declan. Mm. I just mm. show people what I'm doing. And if you want to do it, you do it. If you don't want to do it, don't do it. I don't care. Yeah. It's a tough one, right? Because it seems like an industry that we'd all love to be super. And you see it in some countries seem to be doing it better than others. I, like, cause I've had the experience of living in Belgium and Ireland and I feel in Belgium, we get seen quite quickly. Whereas, you know, there seems to be long waiting times at, at home and things like that. So there, there, there are some examples of, of best practice. And right. I know from talking to doctors that it, it can be a frustration for them. Um, you know, when, when something's maybe scrawled onto, uh, a thing of medicine and they're thinking god how many am i meant to be given here or what's you know what is this and 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 that can cause and that that's one of the the wastes right one of the eight wastes is then the defects because you're thinking oh hold on what was scribbled onto that form then you have to go and check and it's it's wasted time so uh, hopefully you know this is something that will be be taken into account in the future and that For and instance, i'll give you the here's a big thing with the medical industry you know i deal yeah. with it with my mom and everything so you know their solution for everything is more drugs more drugs oh we'll put them on this we'll put them on lipitor we'll put them on this we'll put them on that we'll put them on. and i'm like why don't you deal with the real issue the real issue is they're sitting on their ass all the time they need to start getting up and moving and then all of a sudden they don't have to take all this crap mm -hmm. right we just mm -hmm. we just keep layering on uh band-aids that have nothing to do with the core issue and that's what i did with my mom you know everyone's the doctors always say oh you got to be careful i've got to be careful and i'm writing a book now called aging lean or lean aging mm. and it's about my mom and it's about not managing the decline and the and the different mentality that everybody's got about oh well you know you got to be careful you know what my opinion about my mom is if she dies tomorrow good if she dies at 100 good the bottom line is, she, if she dies tomorrow, she's going to live, be living a full life. She went to Cabrillo National Monument yesterday. We went to the beach yesterday. We did all these great things. Mm. Or the, con the converse is she sits in a chair 12 hours, 15 hours a day. Well, what kind yeah. of life is that? If you live to 100 doing that, what kind of life is that compared mm. to actually living? So everyone's always, well, you're being too hard on me. Who cares? Mm. I mean, she's, mm. she's 95 years old. Let her have a full life. It's not yeah. about it's not about quantity it's about quality and yeah. they completely miss that they want to put everybody on tubes and and, and drugs and just keep alive mm. what kind of life is that yeah 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 but I, I think it also you know and i know it's interesting we're having this conversation about the government right because i read a book recently not for myself actually but for clients it was about quitting smoking right and they went into the finances behind what the government makes off smokers in the uk and i think the stat was 12 billion they, they make that on income duties etc so they make that that money goes into the to the account for them and then the expense of smoking related diseases is only three billion so that's 
that's a, a nine billion profit, right? But like, so that you've got to look at the driver behind these things. And I was reading this and I was thinking, okay, this isn't just cigarettes, guys. This is shit food. Oh, sorry, excuse my French. No <laughs> um, but this is just, you know, this is sweets and th the same situation with these, like with, with bad foods as well, because the government does have an interest in these being sold because there's excise and things on that. So it's just, uh, there's a spiral there, I think, that, that not everyone thinks about and recognizes, which is a big shame as well, you know? Right, 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 right. So it, it, it well that that's because they're not really long term thinkers. They're not really thinking about what's really going on. And mm -hmm. you know, it, when the minute people really care about people and not about the, protecting their turf, then everything changes. But mm -hmm. you know, most people are protecting their turf. They they want to, you know, they're, they're protecting the status quo. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I think it's going to lead on to just the last question, uh, Paul, for this has been really interesting. I just want to finish with, you know, when you're like, you live in this lean lifestyle, right? Do you ever get tired of looking for improvement everywhere? How do you switch off? <laughs> no, I don't. Because like I said earlier, every day my life improves. And every day I experience the benefits of the improvements I make. And as a result of that, uh, my life is richer day after day. So just the opposite of anything, I'm more energized to improve the next day because of what I improved the day before. So it's just the opposite. It makes me even more energized. That's why I never switch off. The reason why I do lean and the reason why I'm so crazy is remember this statement that I'm going to say, I feel the benefit. That's it. There's a benefit to it and I feel it. It isn't, it isn't on a chart and a graph. It isn't on a chart and a graph. It isn't something yeah. I have to look at my computer and go to my Excel spreadsheet to see that my bottom lines increase. It's that every move I make, I'm, I encounter the, the, the improvements that I made the day before, the week before, the year before, and I feel how it affects my life, how I, I flow through life. See, I'm not, I'm not stopping and starting all the time when I work. I think it's just work. Yeah, yeah. Does that make sense? Big time, big time. And I think I, I meant to mention it at the start about Fast Caps because it's a brilliant, it's a brilliant YouTube channel as well for people who've listened to this and are really interested in the, in the process and seeing these live improvements, right? And, and what's fascinating is that, that it's always looking at making the work process super efficient. And so people aren't wasting time looking for a tool or, or anything like that. And I know it's because you make an array of woodworking products and tools. And that's how the factory is set up to be, you know, ultimately for the customer. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Don't laugh by yourself. <laughs> I, I, I'm, it's good to have an audience. <laughs> if you knew, if you knew what I go through with these women, I read three of them. Oh my gosh, it's, just, it's so unbelievable. <laughs> it's, it's like it's like herding cats every day. <laughs> well, I tell you what, they've they've uh, they've lived to a great age, so they've obviously got the secrets of the lean health as well, Paul. Oh gosh, it's it's so unbelievable. <laughs> I can tell you more. But I'm I'm actually making a video for every day I'm with them. Oh great! Okay. And and I'm, we're on day nine today, and oh gosh, it's crazy here. I got to do something real quick, Declan, for one second. So, so mom, what day is it? It's day nine, right? Day nine. Day nine, and today. We're on an interview with Declan in Ireland. Ireland you're in Ireland, right? I'm, I'm in Brussels, but I'm Irish. Yeah, I'm living in, 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 in Brussels, in Belgium. And today we're doing an interview with the sisters and Declan <laughs> in Brussels. This is crazy. Oh, my gosh. I'm going to add that into our video today. It's just oh nuts. My. Okay, go so ahead. What's, what's on the plan for today then, Paul? Are you guys heading out somewhere? Yeah, we're going to actually probably go to Mexico, believe it or not. We live in San Diego, so that's the plan. So we're, we're pretty adventuresome. 
Oh, nice, nice. Well, look, Paul, all I can say is thank you for giving up your time this morning. To, to I love how it's, it's it, we've gone through the health side of things, but also the manufacturing. And I know my listeners are going to love it because they usually follow me in terms of exercise, nutrition, and there's some absolute right. gems of wisdom there. But I think really importantly, mindset, and, and something that I'm going to take is two things uh, in particular is what you mentioned about feeling the change of lean and looking for continuous improvement, actually feeling it. It's a physical feeling of how you carry yourself and how you bring yourself into the day. Um, and also there was something that you mentioned at the start, uh, which I've now gone blank on, which was going to be my other key takeaway. Yeah, no um, but uh, yeah, but I, but I really liked what, what you had mentioned about that. And I think that's, you know, I think that's really important that people, people remember that and, and, and the, the physical benefit of, of going around and living in this way, you know? Declan, how old are you? All right, well, guess, what do you think? You look like you're 25. I'm 31, believe it or not. Okay, okay so oh. I'm 60. I'm twice as old as you. And when you just forgot that, you, you, know, yeah. you forgot the first point, you made me feel very good because at 60, you forget so much, it's unbelievable. And so when, when a young man like yourself forgets something, I think I'm doing pretty good. <laughs> and now you know what my brain's going like. I'm desperately trying to remember what it was. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I'm, I'm there often, you know, but uh, I, I laugh at it. I laugh it off. Yeah, yeah. But look, thank you so much. And I can't wait to bring this podcast. And it was lovely to meet your, uh, your mother and your auntie. Elizabeth, yeah. thank you very much. I hope you have a lovely day. Say goodbye, Mom. Goodbye. It was nice speaking with you. You too. You too. Pleasure. Not bad for 95, right? I'm telling you, doing great. Doing great. No, um, awesome. Yeah, I just look a big... Living at home too. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, Jeannie. It's good. It's good going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very good. And did she, and so what was, did she play sport growing up, Paul, or just get outdoors a lot? What was the secret? Yeah. No, she, no, you know, no, I wouldn't say, you, Mom, you didn't play any sports, did you? Oh, of course I did. Of course you did. What did you play? What did you play? Basketball. Basketball. Oh, okay. Um, well, I didn't know. She never played any hoops with me, but... <laughs> yes, we went to the Y. Oh, you went to the every, Y. Every Saturday. Every Saturday. To play basketball, and we were a good, good team. Oh, good. Yeah. Right. Right, there yeah. you go. There you go. I learned, nice. And I learned something new about my mom every day i mean that's part of the reason why we're documenting all this mm -hmm. is so mm -hmm. that we never forget all the history and so when they get together they're always talking so my mom was into basketball brilliant yeah maybe she didn't want to uh, school you out in the guy out in the yard paul that might have been it yeah yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> and she just said a lot more too oh yeah we were very active. <laughs> what other things you do just curious uh, dancing dancing modern da dance modern da what else uh, Eating. Eating. <laughs> <laughs> That's my favorite exercise too. What? That's my favorite exercise too. You can tell Elizabeth that. <laughs> That's a good one. That's a good one. That's a funny line, man. Okay. Look, Paul, look, thank you very much. I'm going to actually, what I'll do is I'll stop the recording here, but I just want to say a big thank you to you. And actually, can you let my listeners know where they can find a bit more about you? Yeah, so you just go to paulacres.net is the website. But the most important thing you need to know is I have a new app. I just spent a fortune on it. And it's called Two Second Lean Play. And it has all my books in audio format. So if you like Audible, if a lot of people listen to audiobook, just download my app, Two Second Lean Play. It's on, all, it's on uh, the iOS as well as the Play Store. It's free. Everything's free. My books, I think we have six or seven languages now in audio format. It's incredible. We have Japanese, uh, we have Chinese, we have Spanish, we have English, we have Italian. Uh, I, I could go on and on and on. German. There, there's so many languages there. It's unbelievable. Brilliant. Okay. Well, there you have it, folks. That's where you can find out more about Paul and Fast Caps is the company. They've got an awesome YouTube channel as well. So again, thanks a million, Paul. It was great to meet Elizabeth and your auntie as well. And uh, I'm looking forward to bringing this to people. Okay, bye, Declan. Thank you. Nice speaking with you. You bye -bye. too. <laughs>